in the front, not always from gay universities, but that way. So I, I teach in Columbia, so I assume there were lots of Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> but as is evident in Petronius's use of the term mixed, the bar was not exclusively a venue for gay men. Indeed, gay patrons from the time report that the management only grudgingly admitted gay patrons. It may be the fact that Julius's was a mixed bar in the 1960s, and the fact that its gay patrons tended to dress and behave in a conservative manner, that resulted in the establishment avoiding being shut down in various campaigns to clean up Greenwich Village. It was relatively easy for the city to crack down on gay bars because the New York State Liquor Authority, or the SLA, rules considered the mere presence of a homosexual in an establishment to be disorderly, and owners could be cited for simply serving a known homosexual. In addition, the police used entrapment to arrest gay men in bars and then closed the establishment. Handsome young police officers would dress in what were they considered to be stereotypic gay bar, gay attire, start conversations with men whom they perceived to be gay, and then arrest them after any sort of proposition, or as reported by many men who were arrested, no proposition at all. <coughs> bars where this sort of indecent behavior occurred would be cited. They had to place a sign in their window that stated these premises raided, and they generally had a police officer seated at the door during busy hours. Bars could then lose their liquor licenses and be forced to close. You can imagine patronage went down when this happened. The result was that many legitimate, privately owned and run gay bars were forced to close, and mob syndicates became increasingly involved in opening bars masquerading as private clubs. Very few gay and lesbian New Yorkers were involved in political organizing in the gay community in the, in the 1960s. This was a time, as you know, when most gay men and lesbians were deeply closeted, afraid of losing their jobs, and cowed by the social stigma attached to homosexuality by much of the American populace. So actions such as the sip-in were radical public statements for the time. On April 21st, 1966, three members of the Managing Society, as you've heard, an early gay rights organization, decided to challenge the state liquor authority's rule that made the mere presence of a homosexual in a bar a disorderly act. The idea behind the sip-in was a simple one. A few Manishing members, led by Dick Leisch, would gather at a bar, announce that they were homosexuals, and wait to be denied service. The press would be invited to attend and witness the event. Leisch was influenced by the lunch counter sit-ins that had been organized by African Americans in the South, thus sit-in, sip-in. Leisch told the reporters to meet at the Ukrainian American Village Restaurant at 12 St. Mark's Place, chosen because it prominently displayed a sign that said, if you are gay, please go away. <laughs> but the restaurant had been tipped off and was closed. So the group moved on to a Howard Johnson's on the corner of 6th Avenue and 8th Street, where they sat in a booth, asked to see the manager, and then announced that they were homosexuals and requested a drink. The manager laughed and they were served. Uh, one of the, one, the, um, the Village Voice was one, was one of the um, newspapers that sent a reporter, uh, and Fred McGarra, the photographer. Uh, and so the, the, you're seeing a lot of Fred McGarra photographs, and I'm glad to say that Fred's son and grandson um, are, are here tonight. Um, I love the, the placemats in, in this. <laughs> They had another failure nearby at the Waikiki, which you can see from the palm. Uh, <laughs> and so, having been, as the village boys said, frustrated by hospitality, <laughs> they turned to Julius's. They were fairly certain that they would be denied drinks at Julius's since the bar had recently been raided and patrons entrapped and its management would be sensitive to serving gay men. So what was now four Manishing members, because Randy Wicker had joined them, asked for drinks, and as they were, be as they were beginning to be served, announced that, that they were homosexuals. The bartender said that they could not be served and placed his hand over a glass, an action that was preserved in this now famous photograph taken by Fred McDowell. At least two newspapers reported on this event. A snide piece in the New York Times, three deviants, devious invite exclusion by bars, and a complete and incredibly sympathetic account in the Village Voice with a literary allusion for its title, Three Homosexuals in Search of a Dream. <laughs> the author, 
uh, of this article, Lucy Cornisar wrote, it was a Greek scene in more ways than one. Three heroes in search of justice trudging from place to place. On the other hand, it was a highly contemporary maneuver. It was a challenge to one of the remaining citadels of bias, and a citadel of bias backed up by law at that. The actors in the Odyssey were three homosexuals with four reporters and a photographer as supporting players. The publicity garnered by the SIP enforced the state liquor authority to make a statement about its rules regarding the serving of homosexuals in bars and restaurants. Although denying that the authority had received a complaint, SLA Chair David Hostetter stated that they would take no action against licensed establishments that refused to serve homosexuals, but he also denied that the SLA had ever told licensees that they should not serve homosexuals, a statement that was clearly false considering the significant numbers of gay bars that had lost their licenses in the years leading up to the sip -in. It was up to the bartender, he said, to use their discretion in deciding whom to serve. This very public announcement did negate the generally understood rule that bartenders could, under no circumstances, serve a homosexual. While the SLA refused to take any action formally against Julius's or other bars that refused to serve gay men and lesbians, the New York City Commission on Human Rights was interested and announced that it would use its powers of persuasion to end discrimination against homosexuals. But the commission could do nothing because the law only protected discrimination by sex. But what's really important was the publicity that this garnered. As a result of the successes in Manishin's effort to assure that homosexuals could legally congregate at bars and restaurants and order drinks, and a parallel attempt to stop entrapment, Crackdowns on legitimate gay bars decreased, although they did not stop altogether. The new rulings began to make it easier for non-mob-associated gay and lesbian bars to open and flourish, and for the bar to become a central social space for gay and lesbian New Yorkers for the next several decades. Julius has played a key role in increasing the public's awareness of discriminatory policies towards homosexuals, with the publicity resulting from the sip in creating an important step towards ending this discrimination. The Julius, the Julius is sipping is an early example of organized political action towards gay civil rights in New York. It is now seen as a symbolic turning point in the treatment of homosexuals in New York City. April 21st, 2016 was the 50th anniversary of the sipping at Julius's, and it was fitting that at this anniversary, the site became recognized at the state and federal levels with its listing on the National Register, and you can see Joshua Laird from the National Park Service at the 50th anniversary event announcing the, the listing on the National Register. First, the designation of Stonewall on the National Register and as a National his, uh, Historic Landmark, and now the listing of Julius's are a start. But there is still so much to do, as Amanda will discuss in a minute. Remember that LGBT history is part of American history and world history, and our sites deserve listing alongside the historic sites representing every other group that contributes to the world's heritage. So we're continuing this, and our next goal is to reinterpret a site. We've already heard about the Alice Austin House, and this was list designated New York City landmark very early, maybe 45 years ago, listed on the National Register in a really short uh, report. Uh, that, that basically talks about the architecture. It's a, a Dutch house that, that was then on, uh, redesigned in the 19th century. And it does mention that Alice Austin was a famous photographer, but nothing about who she was and her relationship. So we're going to rewrite this National Register nomination as our, as our next project. And then the other projects that we're going to do, uh, Amanda's going to talk about. So thank you.